Hello and welcome to our webinar, What Remote Work Means for IT Professionals. I'm Ali McDonald, a senior editor at MIT Sloan Management Review, and I'll be your moderator today. Today's webinar will be recorded and the video recording along with the accompanying slide, will be, slide deck will be sent via email in the next three to four business days. In the meantime, today's slides are also available in the handouts module in the GoToWebinar control panel. We welcome your questions during the event. So to submit any questions you have, go to the questions module on the GoToWebinar control panel. We'll save questions for the Q&A period after the presentation, and we'll aim to answer as many as time permits in the hour. Throughout the event, if you're experiencing audio or other technical difficulties, please check the help link in the upper part of your console and feel free to let us know in the chat module. Our speakers for today are Paul Mee, head of the cybersecurity practice at Oliver Wyman, and Keith McCambridge, a partner in the organizational effectiveness practice at Oliver Wyman. Our thanks go out to Central by Log Me In for their sponsorship of this webinar. Paul and Keith, we're looking forward to the discussion. I'll let you both take it away from here. Excellent, thank you for that. So by way of introduction, uh, my name's Paul Mee. Um, as I said in the introduction, I head up the cyber practice for Oliver Wyman, and uh, I'm also living through some interesting times right now as we help uh, clients remain secure and safe uh, through the COVID situation. Uh, despite my British accent, I'm actually based out of uh, New York and work with many clients in many different situations and have been particularly involved in uh, the debates about how people can get back to work, how that can be effective both in terms of the frontline business and customer service end, but also importantly uh, with technology. Keith, do you want to do a quick thumbnail about yourself? Certainly. Thank you, Paul. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Keith McCambridge. I'm a partner at Oliver Wyman in the organizational effectiveness practice. Uh, my background is in occupational psychology uh, and organizational behavior. Much of my uh, career has been focused on uh, leadership, on performance culture. And right now, I'm particularly interested in this seismic shift uh, that we're all having to make uh, from one uh, normal to a completely new normal, uh, but more of that uh, a little later. Back to you, Paul. Very good. So a bit of context and observations before we get into um, some of the meat of this. So our, our world, as Keith indicated, has changed quite dramatically. We have quite alternate modes of working. If we look at the two months from February to, uh, um, to April, uh, there was a 70% increase in remote working. Uh, which is a dramatic change, and, and many organizations struggled through that, um, both in terms of the logistics, simple things like where do I find 50,000 laptops, and how do I make sure that I can actually be in a position whereby uh, people can connect, uh, whether I have Zoom and other communication mechanisms set up, but also a different technology utilization. Now, if you think about much technology that gets used in a corporate environment, and we've moved dramatically into a mixture of remote working and domestic environments, uh, whereby you still want to, the services to be there and things to just remain secure. There's also some, been some significant changes in surprise and demand patterns. Uh, if you look at the banking sector, for example, uh, where they use payments um, through government subsidies, etc., uh, this put tremendous strain on banking systems. And as one of my banking clients said, where we almost imposed a denial of service attack on ourselves because you know, we have 8 million customers basically checking every half an hour to uh, an hour whether the balance had arrived in their account uh, from, the, from the government. Uh, so these are quite dramatic changes to IT. Also less familiar modes of data movement um, with people working more remotely from home then we have a different model of behavior. And there's been a lot of uh, data loss prevention systems where red lights have gone off because you have people who may be going online at 10.30 at night after they put their children down, they want to check a few emails, um, do a bit of analysis, et cetera. Well, in the normal way of working, that will be seen as quite odd and may flag that you know, we have a, a risk here that data may be being exfiltrated. Well, now, working at those time of days, uh, whereby you have to fit in work around your domestic situation is much more common. There's also a rebalancing of, of the chain dynamics whereby reliance on third parties has changed. Uh, certain parties in different geographies have struggled through this and almost every day there's been a ransomware attack on one third party or another uh, whereby that supply chain may be constrained 
or the ability to actually work with that supply chain partner in a more intimate, um, interpersonal way has been compromised, again, because of remote working. Similarly with facilities, where people have either been locked out of facilities because of local government controls, et cetera, or they simply are not in a position where they're comfortable to go into facilities. And a lot of these facilities have the technology and services um, to enable an organization or corporation to run effectively. And these things don't scale down to a domestic situation. Um, so if you think about the large operation centers, especially the security operation centers, these require people to be in a certain place. And again, certain stresses and strains in doing that. Also, this is a massive distraction for management and staff. You know, worrying about their personal lives, worrying about their friends and relatives, uh, worrying about situations where they may be either a contagion themselves, it means it's a distraction. There's an awful lot of things, that, the balls that can get dropped um, if that's not looked after. There's also key personnel risk, and I'll talk more about how this uh, becomes a magnifier and how documentation is important as one of the mitigants against key personnel risk. But if people are sick, if they're not available, uh, and they are, have a key role, where their expertise and their knowledge makes a, a pivotal difference, then that represents a risk as well that's come sharply into focus uh, through the COVID situation. It's also dealing with a double whammy, whereby you may be subject to a cyber attack, as well as not being able to navigate the pandemic situation. So therefore, being able to act in the, the ways you typically would do through a situation room, which is physically a room uh, through a cyber attack, or whether you have storms, whether you have wildfires, etc. The ability to collaborate uh, in an effective way and in an interpersonal way has also had to be rethought. And also in this current environment, there's rogue act of motivation. And while people are distracted, while you may um, not have your best defenses there, uh, rogue actors are going to take advantage. And we've seen a massive uptick in ransomware and also the payments. Um, uh, as one of my colleagues said, there's now been jackpots out there where payments have exceeded $750,000 for certain ransomware attacks. Uh, and the rogue actors know that you're going to be vulnerable, you want to keep your systems running, you want to be able to keep communications in place or healthcare systems in place, and um, so therefore you're much more likely to pay in this stressed environment. So a lot of changes and a lot of different ways of working that we've had to adapt to very quickly um, through the crisis situation. And also, there's been some real practical challenges that have had to be navigated. So as I mentioned, controls across varied domestic environments making sure that those uh, routers have got sufficient bandwidth, making sure we can provide a VPN, again, with sufficient bandwidth and security, making sure as we deal with third parties that they're sufficiently resilient uh, and that they follow the same kind of rules as us and where we do have reliance upon those, we can be sure that that will be there. Also, insider risk, uh, whereby people are now looking at their computers in a domestic environment, which is far more difficult to control uh, than a, a commercial or corporate environment. Just take a simple situation whereby you know, somebody can hold up their phone and take a photograph of the screen. In the corporate environment, you wouldn't be able to do that. You know, there would be cameras there or just other people there. Um, also printing, where people want to print at home, following the, the rules that you would have in a office environment uh, as regards um, filing, as regards disposal, uh, as regards privacy. I mean, you just think about you know, the interested children, interested other people, if you're roommates, et cetera, following those kind of things so you don't accidentally trip into a situation where data is compromised is incredibly hard to manage in these circumstances. There's also teaming constraints. Uh, and, and, and Keith can talk much better about this than I can, but if you think about a lot of what we do as human beings, uh, we are acting teams. We solve problems in teams. We design things. We brainstorm, we whiteboard, and we develop ideas and ways of dealing with problems, uh, often in a highly interactive, highly personal, and localized manner. A lot of that's been constrained as well. We've also got productivity uh, issues uh, where there's been waves of productivity, and again, Keith can talk more about this, but I think my observation from talking to a lot of people across IT and operations is uh, for the first month or so, productivity actually went up because people were less, less distracted. Um, they could get on with things. They didn't have to commute for a start. They didn't have to travel or get on a plane. Um, so productivity um, took a bit of an upswing, and um, a number of organizations have looked at um, 20 and 25% productivity gains uh, for the first five weeks uh, when people started to need to work from home. That has certainly slipped since, and if anything, you know, we're seeing the concept of Zoom fatigue, uh, people tr having trouble context switching, uh, and it's quite important that people can switch context, uh, especially when they're in tense environments, 
You know, that commute home is a way of signaling to your body that we're done with work right now. You know, that conversation over a cocktail at the end of work is a way of signaling to your mind that we're changing circumstances. You know, I'm going to move to a family situation or a personal situation. Because you can't do that in a domestic environment whereby you know, you're on a computer, you're sat in your kitchen, you're sat in your study, you're sat with other, other roommates there, the ability to use context switching and show your mind uh, that things are now different has also had a negative impact on productivity where people are getting tired, they are getting to feeling that they're burned out or overwhelmed. And Keith's going to go into that and he has some very good observations and we'll do a poll in terms of how we're all feeling on this call. And lastly is engagement and morale. You know, your, your ability to run a team, um, to you know, feel that people are connected, people if people are in a winning situation where they're working together, collaborating together, you know, teaming together, you know, those things have been massively restricted. Uh, and for an IT professional where you typically work in the team, you're working with your business partners, your operations partners, everything in from testing um, through to production, through to working with third parties. That ability to feel like you're part of a team and you're engaged, you've got a mixture of camaraderie, banter, uh, and ability to work and spark off each other uh, has been massively impeded in a lot of cases, uh, leading people to have certain concerns about, you know, how am I actually going to be successful in this environment? And on that point, um, Keith, you want to start talking about some of the challenges in this space from a personal point of view, please? Yeah, certainly. Um, so, wow, they do say never waste a crisis. And um, certainly we have had one. Uh, and this has had a, a very different sort of nature and character to it as well. Uh, as Paul mentioned, in those first few weeks uh, when lockdown started uh, to be imposed in various different regions, we did see a fairly significant surge in productivity. And, uh, and what was fascinating were some of the comments from leaders at that time. A, a, a chief executive of uh, Global Investment Bank said, my Lord, I, we're getting we're getting stuff done in two weeks uh, when you told me previously this was going to take six months to achieve. And of course, there was that glorious cartoon that some of you will have seen uh, titled Who Has Led Your Digital Revolution uh, with the CEO uh, and a cross next to his name, the CTO and a cross next to his or her name, and uh, COVID-19 with a big green tick. So, so this crisis has been a tremendous jolt to all organizations and i think what's uh, particularly fascinating about that is that many companies have historically been trying to drive distinct transformations into their organization but have failed to make them stick we've seen projects with uh, if you like noble names like project phoenix or project fast forward instilled within organizations to drive a new way of working. But for one reason or another, they fail to make it into uh, normal common day practice. What's fascinating about this particular crisis is uh, it has lasted long enough for habit to be created. In other words, for the momentum of that change to be sustained and for a new normal uh, to be established and that makes it very hard to be able to return to old ways. In those early months what we were finding were organizations were attempting to codify that productivity advantage that they were gaining uh, and trying to work out uh, how to keep that when in their view normality would return. If we just move to the next slide I'm just going to contextualize this and a little, uh, little longer journey. So this actually is a curve that's um, been around for some time. It's the Yerkes-Dodson Yer law. It, it, it basically describes the relationship between performance and uh, pressure. Uh, and uh, it won't come as any surprise to you that with increasing pressure, uh, so performance increases too, uh, to a point. So if you look at zone one, zone one is really that phase where we're activated, but everything is really ticking along quite nicely. We feel some pressure, uh, but I wouldn't regard uh, anyone in this uh, zone as being particularly alert. That stress, when that stress starts to build 
uh, we start to get more cortisol in our, our prefrontal cortex, we get more alert, we become optimized as individuals. And, and zone two really is best described as being in flow. And, and in my view, and most of the research that we've seen, those productivity peaks that we saw in the early phase of this crisis can be explained in part because of that enterprise shift into zone two uh, and that collective uh, crisis adrenaline, as I would describe it. What's really interesting about this crisis, though, is uh, that unlike uh, previous crises, uh, it keeps on going. Uh, and the context within, within which organizations, markets and individuals operating seem to be sticking. We're creating these new habits. Uh, the world of the workplace arguably will never be the same again. And with that sustained pressure, but with the crisis adrenaline having left the system, in the last month or so, we're starting to see very significant drops in productivity, both uh, in individuals, in teams, and in organizations, as they attempt to try and crack this new working environment with old practices. In other words, we're just going to work harder. We won't need the commute now. We'll start at seven. Uh, we'll finish at nine, ten. The distinction between home and work uh, will become blurred. And of course, that is just simply not sustainable. We find ourselves right now in a phase where the majority of organizations are in that zone three phase and they are trying to navigate their way into the new habits, the new pra practices, the new expectations to maintain and sustain their performance. If they don't, then both individuals and organizations can find themselves in that paralyzed and overwhelmed zone of zone four, where essentially you shut down and uh, find yourself entirely within the grip. So I think, this is something that is changing weekly, monthly. We are starting to develop the new ways of thinking. We're starting to develop the new ways of leading and driving performance such that we can move our organization and ourselves back into zone two and even in zo into zone one. Uh, but we're right in the midst of that discovery. Just as an aside, before I ask you all, where you are on this curve, um, it's very difficult to stay in zone two for any extended period of time as well. As you know, uh, elite athletes will try and develop peak performance for a particular event or for a particular moment, just in the same way uh, other uh, professions find it hard to be able to sustain that alertness and that leveling engagement for sustained periods of time. So we're gonna to have to change the way we work if we're going to build the individual and organizational resilience uh, that we all need. Now let's, let's ask you all, let's take a, a poll now and have a look uh, at where uh, you would place yourself on this curve. Um, so zone one, that's that first zone of activated. Zone two, that's when the pressure increases and optimizes your alert state and really puts you in that performance flow. Zone three, when you start to degrade your performance with too much sustained pressure. And then zone four, when you start to feel uh, enclosed, shut down. So do select one. Let us know which zone you think you fall in right now. Terrific, thanks, Keith. And I really like this slide. And when when you showed it last week to me, I, I said the same thing that you mentioned earlier that um, it, it's changing weekly or daily yeah. in some cases. It's going back and forth. So when you talk about sustaining and being and and finding sort of the most effective flow, what you know, what are some of the methods that organizations are are using to kind of Obviously, you can't stay in one zone, but how do you yep. put parameters on when you're going too far across, when you're venturing into three and four? And maybe we can get to that after the poll is finished. Yeah, most definitely. 
All right, so well, the results are in, and we have a lot of people are in zone three. So Forty-eight percent are feeling they're in the distracted zone. The yeah. activated, twelve percent. Thirty-seven percent are saying zone two, and then three percent um, in that you know shut down sort of in know, the grip. Yeah. In the grip. Yeah. No, these are fantastic and fascinating results, and. And frankly, they don't surprise me. Uh, where we have been running uh, this poll elsewhere, we are seeing people in the red, as it were, or starting to rev more than the engine can take it. There is some good news. The good news for those in zone three and in zone four, and I'll talk more of those uh, about those who are in zone four in a moment. The good news is that what we're talking about here is resilience. And resilience is not a trait in the same way that the color of our eyes, uh, our skin color, our height, uh, the color of our hair is a trait. These are, this is a skill. Resilience is something that you can develop. And, and to your point, I think really one of the most important things to do is periodically check yourself against this curve. Check yourself against which zone you think you might be in but one of the things that most of the research into resilience points to is uh, those who would describe themselves as having the best resilience often have very good networks and very good social connections around them. Isn't it? It's no surprise then, isn't it, that, that actually in lockdown, when we're excluded from our networks in a physical context, it's testing our resilience even more. But what I would suggest you do is, number one, check yourself against this curve. And number two, reach out and ask a friend or a member of family just to check you as well. You know, do I look normal? Am I appearing as though I'm progressing in a normal way? Or have you got some anxieties about my frustrations? Do you think I am out of sorts in some way? So this is a choice to develop. It is something that you can actually strengthen. And if you do find yourself in zone three, what are the things that actually will move you back into zone two? two? Could be as simple as sleep. Could be as simple as good diet. It could be as simple as getting away from the desk and being able to take a walk, read a book, listen to some music. A last comment just on zone four. Um, for those four, three, four percent in zone four, um, I, I feel your pain. Uh, we have all been in there at some stage. I would urge you. Uh, and I encourage you actively uh, to reach out to a friend, reach out to a colleague right now. Uh, they will help you. They, the, the, the very act of sharing that anxiety will make a, make a significant difference. And of course, the loneliness of lockdown is almost making uh, uh, the pain of being in zone four, and if you like, the entrapment of zone four, even harder. So do reach out and remember this is a skill and not a trade. I think what might be useful is just to talk about how leaders are responding to this um, as well. Paul, did you have a, uh, did you want to comment on on something before I moved on? No, it's just a, a comment and this is probably a more personal thing, Keith, is that you know, I, I count myself kind of oscillating between two and three, depending on the day, depending on the meeting in certain yeah. cases. So. For, yeah. for me, it's not been as constant. I mean, you can always see where the, the arrow is pointing. I'll, I'll flip between around that arrow, as it were, the kind of axis, just because of the nature of work and the nature of interaction. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Frankly, this could be something that could be affected by a meeting. It could be affected right. on an hourly basis. But I think uh, being mindful of where you are and being mindful that consistently you appear to be in zone three deserves action. Uh, and I think, right. you know, choosing uh, to take control of it is very important. Uh, if anybody has the time, I would encourage you to read uh, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, uh, a very uh, eminent uh, psychologist who said that the one ultimate freedom uh, nobody needs to let go is their ability to choose how to respond to a situation. And I think those people who feel paralyzed often feel as though that choice has been taken away from them. You always have that choice. 
Okay, let's move on to um, the next slide. So, so let's just talk about what this means for leaders, actually, and, and what this means for you as you manage teams. I think the fascinating thing is, in a conversation I had with the chief executive a month or so ago, he said, I just can't feel the organization anymore. And another uh, chairman of a business, she had been appointed into her role uh, not that long ago. She said, I, I just, I, I, the way I led, the way I managed, the way I felt the pulse of the organization and of the board was to have those informal moments, to be able to see people, to touch, to be able to go and visit. Essentially, it was a bit like uh, being a pilot, but being able to look out of the window, having those terms of reference, if you like, that told you how high you were, whether you were in the middle of the runway or not. And if we flick to the next slide, essentially what we've done is, it is blacked out uh, the exterior, put the covers on the windows, and we're flying on instruments only now. And I think that's a fascinating context because that is meaning that there are some leaders who are incredible social animals and, and got their pulse from their people and their teams by uh, lots of social contact, they are having to learn new skills in terms of how they connect, how they empathize, how they monitor and evaluate the resilience of the people around them. When actually Zoom is predominantly, or video conferencing is predominantly about uh, converging on a decision, uh, very functional and has very limited time for chit chat, uh, social connection, uh, and if you like, emotional exploration. So more of this a little later, but what we're seeing is a change that I think is going to be systemic, and I think it's going to be sustained. Uh, it is unlikely that we are will see workforce uh, far and wide returning in the numbers that happened previously, not because of health issues, but because actually Productivity has been enhanced for many, but we have still got to work out how to lead, how to behave, and how to create the right sustainable habits so that we in ourselves and us as organizations maintain a sustainable and healthy working environment. Now, uh, enough of that. I think uh, it might be time to move on to some more practical aspects. So, Paul, back to you. Right, so uh, and you'll, you'll see a contrast between the way I think about certain things and the way that Keith does. So I want to go into some quite practical things that, that, that can be done in this space. So um, and I've got my own checklist here to kind of remind me. So let's talk about documentation. Now, documentation more than ever uh, matters. Uh, and there, there are a number of reasons for this. And these um, cute pictures are there to remind me of these topics. So the actual controls themselves, um, am I doing the right things? Uh, is it written down, both in terms of what I've chosen to do, will also give me guidance on what to do? Uh, because without controls, if you're unfamiliar with the situation, or even if you are familiar with the situation, or you're getting fatigued or distracted, uh, then there's a chance that you magnify the risk uh, for a given organization, given set of processes, or, or given set of systems. Also increasing the, 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 the need for the, have an audit trail or a journal saying, I did the right things. And this has become particularly important as people have gone through crisis playbooks and running through those and, and saying, I did do this, I did communicate with this, I make sure I've got contingencies in place, make sure people can have masks, make sure people understand the workforce uh, considerations when they're communicating with each other. And so documentation also is a form of audit making sure we understand that we are taking the right measures and that these things are replicable uh, and we have a, almost a proof point um, to say that we did the right things is increasingly important. So those are some requirements as it were, but uh, as we get into the workforce matters and some of the things that Keith was um, talking about, there's also documentation gives me greater ability to have contingency. If things are written down, then I'm in a position whereby another individual can actually assimilate themselves to a guidebook, can look at the instruction manual as it were, uh, and can understand what's going on. If that's just in the heads of other individuals, uh, then your ability to call upon a contingent workforce, uh, to have a succession plan, uh, to have a good deputy, 
uh, becomes massively impeded because um, if they weren't there, if they don't know how things are done, they are new to this, then it's going to be harder to climb that experience curve um, if the documentation is out of date or insufficient. And also, we, we as human beings in our work life um, tend to learn through mentoring. Now, regardless of all the, 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 the manuals that are out there, there's a lot of things that we do in an interpersonal situation whereby somebody shows us. Uh, I worked on a help desk in the early part of my career, and there were certain issues that would come up, and people say, oh, yeah, you deal with that by pressing this button, and you have to reset that, etc." None of that was written down, but because you were in a close proximity with other people, that kind of mentoring through what to do, what to say, how to fix things, and how to deal with situations becomes a natural part of us as human beings in the workplace. Well, when that's not available, then you need something else you can lean on. It doesn't need to be a paper document, but guides in what to do, everything from as simple as a YouTube video, making sure that you know, things are uh, accessible through digital means, because if that mentoring construct is being impeded by the work, remote working of the crisis, then you need a good alternative and good documentation that's accessible, easy to navigate, and useful readily to a situation it becomes more and more important. And then the other part, and um, in regards to the crisis, 15% uh, of people um, in the last five months got a new job. Um, they're working in different situations. Uh, they're working in unfamiliar situations. And again, that ability to assimilate to an environment whereby uh, you may have someone help you, someone guide you, talk about the way things get done around here, uh, is again being massively impeded by the remote working imposed by uh, the COVID situation. So documentation, again, has a key role in making sure that as people are new to the organization or they're taking on new roles, that that's sufficiently well explained, or at least gives them you know, a platform on which they can start to learn and ask the right questions. Uh, because in an informal environment where you can ask people uh, either over a glass of wine, over a coffee, over lunch, and again, has been massively impeded. So documentation more than ever matters in terms of your ability to show people how things get done. And again, if those people are not available because they're indisposed because of the crisis, whether they're ill themselves or looking after family members, then again, documentation has a key role to play uh, to make sure that you understand what needs to be done under what circumstances. Alison, does, does that make sense? Is there anything else that I should be covering on that or, or tests that you have? Right now, it looks like we don't have um as many questions coming in on this section, but I'm excited to to hear what else you guys have in store. Okay, so let me get into uh, a few other areas then. Just thinking about dealing with third parties, uh, which brings a certain degree of complexity because again, these third parties may not be on your premises. Uh, they themselves may be in far off geographies uh, and certain um, states whereby they won't be allowed to go into their own work as we've seen uh, with uh, parts of India uh, in the early parts of the crisis. And the, the key statement is that you can't outsource risk. You can outsource services, you can outsource technology, uh, you can outsource um, um, certain um, coverage, uh, but you can't outsource the risk. The risk is still on you to do that. And there's certain considerations in doing um, managing risk through this kind of situation. So in, in no particular order, but I'll read from left to right is aligning the compliance controls and cyber risk management of your organization um, to your third parties so that what's important to you is important to them. And if there are areas where you need to get alerts, you need to be communicating uh, that you've practiced doing that uh, and you know what to do, uh, and their standards uh, for perhaps the level of controls they have are consistent with what you need. Also, you need to know when they have a problem. Um, you should have alert mechanisms, the ability to communicate with each other when they have services that aren't available. And we have seen just this morning uh, that the internet services for a large part of the UK went out, and which caused a lot of drama associated with that because you're reliant upon it. And when something happens to your third party, you need to know about it, either because there may be a contagion effect or they themselves may be distracted uh, trying to put out fires in their own backyard. The other thing, and this has come sharply into focus through the crisis, is knowing each other well before bad things happen. Um, as a, a good colleague of mine said, you should not be shaking hands during the fire. You should not be shaking hands on the battlefield. Knowing each other, um, who to contact, being familiar with them, 
being familiar with their ways of working, their roles and responsibilities is tremendously important um, to do before bad things happen. And being able to test and drill that together, increasingly third parties, especially large scale cloud providers and others, um, are so critical to your um, business. That when you do drills, either through a cyber attack or other events like a pandemic, like a storm, uh, like a um, deep snow or fires, testing and drilling together has become more important than ever because they'll have a role to play. You'll have a dependency on them to work effectively through that. And again, to my point, you don't get to know them or be familiar with them when the storm happens. You know how you're going to act together, how you communicate and how you coordinate because you've practiced it. Just like you would with a fire drill where you know which ethics to leave out the building, who the fire marshal is, how they'll call the old clear, doing that with third parties is just as important. And also, now's the time to think about, do I need many third parties? If I've got tens of thousands of third parties, then now's the time to be thinking, is there a way of buying down that risk by thinking about rationalization and simplification? Do I really need different vendors who provide more or less the same service? Uh, do I really need that, that level of variety? Uh, do I need that um, breadth of third parties that are out there? So, and we've worked with a number of organizations who said we could probably have 40% um, fewer uh, parties than we have now, which would give us a more manageable set of risks to maintain and to mitigate uh, through our third party landscape. So there's some practical things that can be done when thinking about those risks. I'm going to switch to Keith now because again, with his expertise as you heard for the first part is beyond just some of those very practical things to do, there's also a question of mindset. So Keith, do you want to talk more about that? Thank you, Paul. Yeah, so um, this is uh, this is uh, an area that is uh, particularly interesting uh, for me right now because I mean a lot of my work um, stands on the shoulders of uh, giants such as Edward de Bono and Malcolm Gladwell when they were uh, uh, studying, understanding, and explaining uh, the way in which the human mind works and. Many of you will have uh, heard some of their descriptions and some of their thinking, especially around uh, uh, Edward de Bono's concept of rivers of thinking. Uh, he talked about how uh, knowledge is uh, something that uh, really drives a lazy brain to seek efficiency rather than to uh, seek challenge and difference. In other words, how you've thought and what you've experienced in the past is likely to create very strong currents in your rivers of thinking. And it's very hard to get out of those and actually to think about things in a fundamentally different way. This is something that actually happens a lot in executive teams and uh, boardrooms where there is almost a, a confirmation bias present to individuals who understood their industry many years ago, arguably, uh, and are no longer relevant in terms of the change in the context that is happening to their businesses and in the markets that they operate in. That confirmation bias is seeking information to confirm their view and discounting information that disproves their view. So keeping them, if you like, in those rivers of thinking. So more of that in a moment, but I think another characteristic uh, that is particularly interesting is uh, the, uh, the, the component of expectation. And if we just flick on to the next slide, uh, Paul, I, I just wanted to share with you one of the real problems that I think uh, this crisis has, uh, has thrown up. There was a, uh, a very interesting character called Admiral Stockdale who used to fly for uh, the American uh, Navy. He was a naval aviator and was shot down uh, during uh, a conflict in the uh, Far East. He was put in prison for seven and a half years, uh, at very poor conditions, conditions that actually led to some of his younger colleagues not surviving that uh, seven and a half years. And he said that fundamentally, uh, the reason why he survived and many of his colleagues didn't was he uh, always believed that he was going to prevail. 
but he dealt with the brutal reality of each day as it came, and he never set himself any deadlines. What we all saw probably early on in this crisis was people uh, saying, well, we'll be back to work by September. Uh, this will all have blown over by, uh, by uh, December, by Christmas, and we'll be back uh, to our good old ways again. Unfortunately, in uh, Admiral Stockdale's instance, those Christmases came and went for many of his colleagues, and essentially they just died of a loss of hope. Their, uh, their false deadlines, their, their hopes was not, were not anchored in any reality, uh, and they set these false dawns for them. Of course, when they passed, they lost more of their energy and their motivation. I've seen exactly the same thing happen in leadership and in organizations uh, since the lockdown uh, commenced and, and since we found ourselves in this global pandemic. It, it, you have to be able to be realistic about what is ahead of you, but not uh, be so optimistic that you have a blind hope uh, and you have to make sure that how you're envisaging the future is not based on any certainty that you uh, feel it, it uh, exists, but based fundamentally on the ambiguity of the world that we find ourselves in. So the first thing I would say is make sure you and your organizations are confronting the reality that you're in. Don't make any predictions. A week is a long time in this, in this uh, industry, in this market, in this economy right now. Uh, be open uh, to how uh, this volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world is developing. And this brings me on to my next slide, because actually what we uh, have found historically is uh, organizations that struggle to adapt to the velocity of change uh, in the current economy are much better described as having a fixed mindset. They trade off their knowledge rather than their capacity to learn. And Herminia Abara, professor at London Business School, so I think um, uh, a lecturer in the States, I think at Harvard previously, she talks about organizations and leaders needing to move from being know-it-alls to learn-it-alls. And she describes actually how leaders were 20 years ago, 70% focused internally in their organization, 30% focused on their markets, uh, on the competition, and on the sort of macroeconomic environment that they were finding themselves in. It, now that has, that has turned up on its head, where some of the best leaders are fundamentally connected and obsessed with their market. They are learning all of the time, and they are beg, borrowing, and stealing new practices uh, from elsewhere and bringing them into their organization. They're also constantly trying to anticipate unmet customer needs, and in that context, need to be learning all of the time. That's interesting also in terms of the way in which we lead now, because that would imply that many of our senior leaders, many of our board members who grew up arguably in a different economy, now no longer have the knowledge to be able to serve this volatile and uncertain world. They might have an expertise in leadership, but fundamentally their focus now needs to be on creating the right environment for their people to be able to make decisions in the place where it's needed most at the front line. And a last thought on this is you have to avoid the competency traps. Normally we invest in the things that we're really good at. Normally we seek to get returns on exploitation of the things that we're really good at because actually the returns are more certain and closer in time frame than the returns of exploration are. And yet right now, all bets are off in terms of how markets are going to develop and how organizations are going to drive a performance and success. And one last thought on, on this. One of the biggest revolutions uh, that was happening just before lockdown in organizational effectiveness was in performance management. And it was the move away from historic retrospective marking of people's homework intermittently, maybe once at the mid-year if you were lucky and once at the end. It's moving away from that backward-looking 
management of performance where people try to justify what they did and moving towards performance enablement where actually the frequency of contact that leaders have with their people is far higher and they those leaders are much better trained in being able to observe record classify and evaluate performance are able to skillfully provide feedback but then go without one step further and stretch and grow their people continuously throughout the year by great coaching. That is a, a revolution that was starting before COVID. All of those skills of frequency of contact, of stretching and growing, of giving people the opportunities to learn and to explore rather than to exploit, those are more relevant now in a COVID context than they ever were before. We can talk a little bit more about that subsequently. Paul, back to you. Very good. Okay, so uh, and the, you lead into a very good topic and the, the consultative engagement um, uh, by, by management. And I, I love this, this kind of you know, getting somebody to stretch themselves but making sure that they soft landing should they not be able to uh, be as successful as they'd hoped in this particular endeavor. So Keith, why don't you and I go through the two-hander just to conclude here. So I'll let you start on the left-hand side of the page and then I'll pick up in my usual practical way on the right-hand side. So do you want to kick us off with uh, your view on virtual leadership tools? Yes, of course, and how complementary uh, our skills are. So I think a couple of things on this. The first is, Many of us have heard about uh, psychological safety. It's an expression that has been uh, used in some cases, arguably overused, but it is a precondition to experimentation. It's a precondition to being able to develop the right mindset. It's a precondition to being able to uh, uh, stretch and grow both yourselves and the processes and procedures that exist within an organization. So uh, firstly, developing the right virtual tools, virtual leadership tools and techniques to be able to enable performance is a real priority now. And making sure that, I, mean, I love the expression that Paul used, it's very difficult and very dangerous to be shaking hands on the battlefield. Absolutely right. Despite the fact that this virtual world moves you away from your people, the closer you get to your people right now, the more you will be able to support their resilience and enable their performance. And then I think the second uh, point I would make is uh, the right mindset, the gro a growth mindset is fed by that psychological safety uh, and fed by that continuous debate and conversation that you will have with your people in terms of how you manage their expectations. That leads to you being able to nurture and build individual uh, and uh, team resilience. What we're talking about here is the jolt, arguably, that COVID has provided us to move away from historical performance management and towards a truly enabled environment. So I think they, they would be some of the things that I would, would highlight. And I, I think the last thing I, I would mention on this is a lot of people would say right now that, uh, you know, it's really difficult to be able to develop the right collaboration, the right relationships, the right connection with your people. Our experience is that in the last two months, especially, the innovation and the creativity that both our teams in the co-creation space, but other organizations as well have created is phenomenal. And the, the ability to collaborate in this new media is, uh, is, is not going to be hampered in the longer term. We are stepping out of our rivers of thinking and developing new ways to consult, to collaborate, and to be cohesive. Um, Paul, you'll have some views and thoughts on this too, I'm sure. For sure, so on, on the practical side of the page then, not a piece of advice is impractical, but uh, there's, there's, a, there's a maintaining a tr transparent and, and visible projects portfolio. As Keith showed in that kind of um, zone three, being on the hamster wheel is not a great place to be. And, and giving your teams 
visibility on what's coming uh, can create a certain amount of energy and excitement because they can see new possibilities. They can see a way forward. They're not in this circular life. It's more linear where they can see uh, there are exciting projects on their way. Also recognizing that IT is likely to change the demands on IT, um, the way technology gets used, the way data gets exchanged, and the more mobile, more remote workforce. Thinking about the skills and capabilities required so that they are consistent uh, with your strategic future of IT. Um, you know, having an idea that you've got yesterday's technology tomorrow is not going to be particularly motivating. Uh, so thinking about what skills I need uh, consistent with where technology is going in this new world is also vitally important. There's also understanding and defining risk appetite and tolerances. You know, working in a different way, what will I tolerate? Uh, what is my risk appetite when I've got people who are working remotely on what might be confidential, sensitive, or um, time or mission critical um, systems and capabilities? How am I going to manage that and uh, how do I actually deal with some of the risks associated with that in a very practical way? And then lastly um, is upgrading performance management capabilities. There are some real heroes that have been shining through for the last three months in this and making sure they're given due recognition. This may mean bending some of the ways that people have been historically compensated, recognizing that a manager through this remote working situation, this kind of slightly at arm's length or virtualized working requires different skills, but making sure that we recognize that because as Keith said, if we still have an old mindset, that's not going to be effective in a new world. So thinking about as we're going to behave in a different way for what could be permanently, what could be the next one year, the next three years, making sure that our performance management and how we judge people, how we compensate people for their performance uh, sufficiently recognizes this different way of working. Yeah, so, one, one thing to just add to that, if I might, Paul, um, I think um, this uh, sense that we should be constantly on right now, uh, the people getting up at seven, uh, and not really switching off until later into the evening uh, is something that is going to have to stop, frankly. Um, and one of the ways in which organizations are starting to look at that is to instead of looking at measuring performance in terms of inputs and activity, actually to look at performance in terms of outcomes and impact. In other words, I'm not going to supervise you. I'm not going to tell you what to do or when to do it. I'm going to be very clear about what my intent is, and I'm going to be very clear about the outcome that I need from you in the context of that intent. How you do it, when you do it, and who you do it with is entirely up to you. And, and I think this uh, is an interesting area that organizations, including ourselves, are starting to explore, uh, that actually, if you have an outcome-based performance model, attendance or clock watching or a sort of culture of being present uh, is fundamentally challenged and gives people the opportunity then to be able to manage their lives and manage uh, their own personal circumstances in a different way. And one last thought on this, I love uh, the expression, instead of working from home, working from anywhere. And I think we're probably going to see more of that uh, as time goes on. And I think managing performance through outcomes is possibly going to be able to enable that rather than uh, limit our capacity to find that balance in our lives going forward. Very good. Alison, you want to take us home? Yes, thank you both. So thank you so much for that overview um, of this extremely important and timely topic. And we have a lot of questions from our viewers, so we'll jump right in now. Um, let me actually, I'll turn my camera on as well to join you. So unsurprisingly, we had a lot of questions come up from the zone slide. And one person wrote that they were feeling like they were in zone three, not necessarily from workload, but from aggressive management decisions. And so other, other folks were mentioning the same thing that um, in some ways, the constraints of remote work, the decisions that organizations need to make um, given COVID's impact um, are having major effects. And so is, are there ways, you, you did get into this a bit throughout, but are there ways in which leaders can really recognize from both the practical and mindset 
uh, frame that you both walked us through of how to keep teams engaged and to recognize that you know there's only so many so much that you can push on people there there are limits that people have yeah i, I think it's um I, I happily pick that one up i, I think leaders uh, often underestimate how much um uh the smallest little expressions uh or uh behaviors uh can be felt in their teams leaders can help uh, build resilience or they can fundamentally hinder uh, uh, that and can detract from uh, the well-being and balance of their employees and their team members. And uh, and this is, for me, I think this is very much a leadership responsibility. And I, and I do believe in the philosophy that leaders are there to serve their people and create the right environment for them, not people being in the service of leaders. And I think there are occasions when, at, even in my organization, where uh, leaders or partners are focused on an outcome, are focused on productivity, are focused on a deadline, are focused on uh, the speed and cadence of getting things done, especially in crisis, uh, and forget about the shadow that they cast uh, and the profound effect that they can have on, on the people around them. I, I think um, back to that curve and how productivity has dropped off, I think it's really interesting. A lot of people actually in crises uh, tolerate directive leadership in the crisis because we're in a crisis. We need to get some stuff done. Um, that tolerance wanes after the crisis has left. Uh, and I think, you know, really being able to connect and rather than seeing people as a, a face on a screen, to see them as a human being with a family in the room with them, possibly, or in the next room with them. I think that's a very important thing. And it is a leader's responsibility to serve their people. So a great question. And it it it, it rests on all of our shoulders to look after our people. Exactly. Um, and, and Paul, to actually jump back to when you asked me if there were questions, of course, at the moment there weren't. But then we got a nice question about documentation. So this person had mentioned that you know, in, in IT and in, in organizations, teams are always thinking about tools. So what tools and systems do you think, especially now with remote work and this hybrid that a lot of companies are going to be experiencing as, you know, the presumption of the new normal is that things are not going to be exactly as they were. How can, how can teams really be documenting effectively? Are there different ways that people need to be approaching it? Knowledge bases, corporate social networks, what do you think is really making a difference right now? So I, I, it's, a, it's a really good question because I, I think we've 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 almost been forced into a multimedia uh, environment whereby, you know, doing um, guidance, whether it's on you know, webinar type environments, YouTube environments, but also more use of collaborative tools, whether it's Slack, etc. And Slack's great in terms of a collaboration tool because it allows you to follow a thread, be part of a dialogue, dip in when you've joined it slightly late and see the whole history. Uh, so we've seen a massive uptick in uh, collaboration tools, but even just get basics right where people have gone, okay, this documentation is clearly out of date. This playbook was not useful to the situation. You know, we, we owe ourselves. We've almost got, in quotes, a documentation debt here uh, that, that we need to deal with. So I think it's also been a bit of a wake-up call for organizations to say, we're more reliant upon these things in times of crisis and times where we can't necessarily get that one-to-one -one mentorship or just reach over a desk and say, hey, Bob, what's the answer to this? Um, so I think there's been a move towards more collaboration, more updating of documentation, more use of multimedia uh, to put messages out there and enable people at their own speed and their own time uh, to get hold of the information that we need. And again, to Keith's point in terms of you know, this may represent a permanent change in the way of working, I think the digital documentation and the ability to make things available on people's um, own terms is going to be the way of working in the future. Terrific. Thank you so much for that. And um, actually, to go back to, to one of the slides that Keith was walking through, and I think this was um, actually touching on Hermine Arbara's you know, know it all versus learn it all. Um, and this dovetails a bit with, with knowledge sharing and, and documentation, too. We got a question that was around you know, how in such a clinical environment of being remote and distant can we really learn new ways? Um, can we learn new things and kind of learn new mindsets sustainably 
and consistently um, are there changes that teams will need to make in order to to really do those mind shift, uh, mindset shifts? Yeah, so uh, it's a great question. And um, yeah, she's a absolute heroine of mine, learn it all uh, and not know it all. I think it is profoundly relevant for right now. I also think that actually we underestimate the creativity, originality uh, and innovation capability of our own people. Uh, there are individuals in our organization who are fixing things, who are developing new ways of working, who actually aren't as constrained by these old rivers of thinking and probably a lot fresher in terms of how they can challenge that. And, and again, I think it goes back to leaders being able to activate and access that creativity. Uh, and I, I think co-creating new ways of working with your people is a very, very successful way of driving change pre-COVID. I think it's a brilliant way of, of trying to develop new mindset shift uh, post or during or post-COVID. Uh, the one thing I would say is that people love what they design. Mm -hmm. And if you're able to create a movement of ideas and generation, generating a new mindset a learning growth mindset within an organization, then leaders actually can step back and watch this sort of proliferation of development and innovation. You know, the, the, the worst types of mindset uh, change attempts are when it's imposed down from above. So I, I would encourage people to look into their organizations, right to the front line, allow them to co-create these new ways of working right there, uh, and then watch the, the the take up as you build that movement because people love what they what they create themselves. So you know your expertise and and your capacity is in your organisation now. No, notwithstanding that, um, seeing what other organisations do, seeing what other walks of life do, is also uh, really interesting. I saw it very interesting study uh, and piece of work that was looking at how you develop uh, collaboration and quality relationships between uh, NASA and the space station. They're working virtually, uh, and yet they have deep friendships developed over long periods of time. Uh, and uh, quite interesting the way in which they use their time, not just always for activity and task, but for some other uh, more human interaction too. Really love that the idea that the co-creation and the investment one has in their own designs really really helps to to make things yeah. stick. Um, we're actually coming up at the end of our event, so I wanted to give Paul a chance too, in case you had any closing thoughts there. No, no, I think I hope this has been useful. Um, it's always a pleasure to uh, present with with Keith. You know, I hope our, our dual perspectives hopefully have enriched the presentation for today. Uh, we're both an email or a phone call away or LinkedIn uh, contact away uh, if anybody wants to uh, have a further conversation on this. Uh, it's a particularly exciting time that we're living through, but also a lot of demands out there in terms of what we do with our people and what we do with our organizations more broadly. Well, thank you so much, both of you. We greatly appreciate um, your time today and over the next few days for our audience. Um, we'll be sending out a feedback survey via email, so be in, on the lookout for that. And also the reminder that the audio recording, um, well, the video recording and the slide deck of this program will be available in three to four business days. So that concludes our event. Thank you all for attending. And thank you so much to our presenters, Paul Mee and Keith McCambridge, and of course, to our sponsor, Central by Logmian. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, Ellie.